Hello again. Um, today we are going to talk about legal reasoning. Okay. So, one of the most interesting aspects of the study of the law, I think, um, is that the law is not static. The law develops over time. Certainly interpretations of the constitution change with time, uh, statutes change over time. And even when um, the sort of foundational document, for example, a statute itself does not change or the constitution itself does not change, the interpretation of it and the way we apply it to new situations um, it is a living thing. It, it, it grows and changes and, and um, turns into something new, kind of at every turn. And it can be extraordinarily interesting to look at how a particular area of law has developed over time. Um, so these legal principles, right, which make up the body of the law, they develop over time through what we call an iterative process, meaning a process that we repeat over and over again of judicial decision-making. And the primary tool for that iterative process is something called precedent. So a precedent is a previous case by the same court or a higher court, a superior court, that establishes a legal principle that you can use to resolve a current dispute. So for example, anytime we have, well, for the moment, um, anytime we have a dispute about the constitutionality of a statute that regulates abortion, the courts are going to invoke a number of specific precedents. They're going to invoke Roe versus Wade. They're going to invoke Casey versus Planned Parenthood. They're going to invoke Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. These are cases that have been decided in the past by the Supreme Court that look at the constitutionality of abortion regulations. And they provide a, a template, if you will, for how to analyze new cases. If a precedent comes from a superior court, a higher court, then the lower court has to follow it. So for example, when the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals hears an abortion decision and they look and they see, oh, here's a Supreme Court decision that tells us how to decide this, they have no choice. Even if they think that the Supreme Court was being stupid, in that last decision. They have to apply precedents from higher courts um, because they are higher courts. If a precedent is actually coming from the same court, so for example, when the US Supreme Court hears a case involving an abortion regulation and the US Supreme Court is looking back at its own decisions on abortion, those cases are still precedent, but the Supreme Court does not necessarily have to follow its own past decisions. There is a norm, right, a general rule called stare decisis, which literally means to stand by things decided. That, that's what it means in Latin. And under the norm of stare decisis, courts generally, follow their own rules. They follow their own precedents, but they don't have to. It is not, um, it is not um, illegitimate for a court to say, you know what, this is how we decided this, you know, this abortion case two years ago, but that was wrong. We're, we're gonna shift gears now. Right? We're going to ignore all of our old abortion cases and we're going to set new precedent now. Right? We're just going to shift gears. 
So for example, um, I did not pick abortion out of the blue. Um, as I'm sure you're probably aware, the Supreme Court right now is considering um, a case involving the uh, a, a, an abortion regulation out of the state of Mississippi. Um, the court heard oral arguments in December on this case. And when the lower court, the Fifth Circuit, heard that, um, or not the Fifth Circuit, I'm sorry, I, mean, I think Mississippi is 11. Um, when the lower court heard that abortion case, they had no choice but to apply a string of precedents from the US Supreme Court, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Roe versus Wade, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services, uh, June Medical Services versus Home Women Health, et cetera. There was a whole um, string of, of cases that they had to follow. But the US Supreme Court may not. The US Supreme Court may say, you know what? We have adhered to the principle of stare decisis for decades with respect to abortion, but we have been wrong and we're going to change the rules, right? Um, so stare decisis is a norm, right? Kind of a general principle. It's not a hard and fast rule. Precedent only really binds lower courts. Um, when a, a, a court is looking at its own precedent, it has flexibility, has more flexibility. Okay. So how do you apply precedent, right? Let's say you are the Fifth Circuit and you have the Texas, um, abortion regulation, the, the heartbeat bill that went into effect in, uh, this last fall. And you have to decide whether it's constitutional or not. You're gonna look at these earlier cases, some of which are going to be about abortion, some of which are not, right? You, there are going to be a whole host of precedents that you need to consider. And when you read the decisions of, for example, the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade, there is a recitation of facts, what happened in Roe versus Wade, what was the statute being challenged, what did Jane Roe want, et cetera. And then there is the law, which in the case of Roe versus Wade is something called substantive due process and the right to privacy. And when you put the facts of the statute in Roe versus Wade together with the law of the right to privacy and substantive due process, you end up with the result that the abortion statute in Roe versus Wade is declared unconstitutional. There, in, in a precedent, right, in an earlier Supreme Court decision, you will find that the Supreme Court has articulated its reasoning, its rationale. Why does the law applied to these facts lead to this particular result? And it's that reasoning that you have to address when you are interpreting a, a new situation. So typically, um, if you have a, a new dispute in front of you, right, you're a court, you have a new dispute in front of you, and you look at a past decision by, for example, the US Supreme Court, it is going to direct the outcome of your case if it is relevant, um, sometimes we talk about a precedent being on all fours or on point, uh, which means that it is a perfect mirror of the current decision. There is no meaningful difference between the two situations, and they should be decided exactly the same way. Sometimes, however, you are going to look at a case, 
a, a precedent and you're gonna say, you know what? We can distinguish this situation from that situation. So for example, um, uh, one of the, the regulations that tends to come up a lot in um, abortion uh, um, cases is something called spousal notification. Um, it's this idea that if a woman wants to get an abortion, she has to notify her husband that she is pregnant and that she's planning to terminate her pregnancy and he has to consent. Um, <clears throat> the imagine, the, and this is purely hypothetical, this is not, not real, let's just be hypothetical now. Um, so imagine that the Supreme Court heard a case involving spousal notification and the statute at issue said that a woman um, who wants to terminate her pregnancy has to notify her husband that she's pregnant and get him to sign a document allowing her to terminate the pregnancy. And imagine that the Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. Right? That, is, that is in the parlance of abortion litigation, um, that is an undue burden on a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy. Now imagine, you are in a different state, right? Or you're, I guess it doesn't have to be a different state. Um, you're in Texas and the legislature passes a law that says that in order for a woman to terminate her pregnancy, um, she has to notify her husband if he is the biological father of the child but there's no requirement that she get his permission. And there is a judicial bypass provision that says that if she is afraid of physical retaliation, um, she can instead have a judge sign um, something saying she does not have to get, um, she does not have to inform her spouse, right? So if she's in an abusive relationship, she can get around this notification requirement. If I'm the court that's reviewing this Texas law, I may say, oh, no, the Supreme Court has said that spousal notification is unconstitutional. Or I may distinguish this case. I may say instead, hey, yet in that past decision by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court found that spousal notification was unconstitutional, but this case is different because this spousal notification is limited to the instance where the, the uh, spouse is the father. It's limited um, in the sense that the woman doesn't have to get permission. She just has to notify him. And it's limited in the sense that she can get around that requirement if she is in uh, fear for her safety. So there's a, a, an alternative path that allows her to still terminate her pregnancy without putting herself at risk. And I may say th this case is just different, All right? Yes, they're both spousal notification statutes relating to abortion, but they are different in ways that matter, that are significant legally. And so I don't have to apply that last precedent to this case. Okay. So what do you do when you're trying to figure out whether a precedent actually applies to your case? Or if there are two cases in the past that might be applicable, but they lead to different results. How do you know which one you should turn to? Um, the way courts resolve these issues is through a process called analogical reasoning. And the, the basic process of analogical reasoning is this. You have two instances. You have a disputed instance. These are just terms, right? about it too much. You have a disputed instance, which in this case is, is the current case, the current dispute, the current 
spousal notification law. And then you have a base point, which is the potential precedent. The last spousal notification case where the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. So you have these two instances, right? The disputed instance and the base point. And now what you do is you look for similarities and differences. How are the two cases the same? How are they different? And then by weighing and evaluating these similarities and differences, you decide whether the disputed instance, the current case, should be classified in the same way as the base point. Should it be followed? Right? So you have to decide whether the similarities are more significant than the differences. So let's look at a concrete example of, of analogical reasoning. Start with a non-legal example, something that you may be familiar with or a situation you may be familiar with from your everyday life. Imagine that I'm hiring somebody and I have a job candidate, an application in front of me, and I'm trying, I'm a law firm. Let's be clear. I'm a law firm. I have a application or resume from a job candidate, and I'm trying to decide whether that person will be a good employee for my firm. So this is the disputed incident, right? Is this person going to be a good employee or not? I now look at my base point, which is an employee that I know is good. And what I now need to do is to decide whether I should classify this candidate the same as a known good employee. Do I classify this candidate as someone who is likely to be a good employee or not? So I look at the similarities and differences and the candidate and the employee, the known employee are both blonde and they both have experience in food service. Now I look for the differences and the differences include that the candidate does not have a college degree while the known employee does. And the candidate is um, short, like five feet tall. And the, um, or I'm sorry, the known employee is um, short. And the, what am I doing? The candidate is short, <laughs> the known employee is tall. It doesn't really matter, it's arbitrary. Um, so we've got, they're different in terms of height. Okay, now it's not enough to just identify the similarities and differences. Um, the similarities is that they're both blonde, they both have food service experience. The differences are that one is tall and one is short and one has a college degree and the other does not. But now I have to evaluate these similarities and differences. They're both blonde. While that is a true statement and it is a similarity between them, I have no reason to think that my current employee is a good employee because of her hair color, right? I don't think the hair color is actually significant. So the fact that they're both blonde is a, a similarity, it is a truth, but it's not relevant. It's not something I should include in this calculation. Similarly, they are different in terms of their height. One is tall, one is short, but I have absolutely no reason to think that the quality of my current employee has anything to do with their height. Again, that's irrelevant. They are, there's, there's no connection between height and your ability to be a, a good employee at a law firm. So yes, that's a difference, but there's no reason for me to include that difference in my calculation. Now let's look at the other two factors. One, is the similarity that they both have food service experience. I'm hiring for a law firm. So that, that similarity may not matter, but I suspect it does because I personally have worked food service 
And I know that food service is a very high pressure job and that it requires you to juggle a number of things at the same time. Um, and it requires you to have good time management and it requires you to have pretty good interpersonal skills. So if they both have extensive experience in food service and it turns out that in fact, the reason that I think my current employee is great is because she's great at managing multiple tasks at the same time and handling stress and dealing with people, that similarity may be relevant, right? That may be something I, I should take into consideration. On the other hand, they have this difference that one has a college degree and the other does not. And now I have to decide whether having a college degree actually makes my current employee a better employee. Is that one of the reasons that my current employee is good at her job? Because if it is, then perhaps I might think, oh, somebody who doesn't have a college degree may not be good at this job. Now, chances are good that what I'm going to think, I hope, is that having a degree is not actually what makes you a good employee. And instead it's the education that led to the degree that's good. So uh, that is helpful. And so maybe I look at this job candidate and I see, oh, she doesn't have a degree, but she went to college for three and a half years and did extraordinarily well in her classes. Um, so maybe they are alike in the way that matters and that they have been trained at an institution of higher education and they were successful at college level work. And the difference that one actually walked across the stage and got a diploma and the other one did not, maybe that difference doesn't matter to me. Or maybe it does, right? Maybe it's absolutely important because one of the things that makes my current employee a good employee is that I know she is planning to go on to law school and she can do that because she has a college degree, whereas my, this job candidate doesn't seem to have that drive, right? Um, because, you know, for whatever reason they gave up on their degree. Um, now, again, if I'm a good employer, I will probably ask the candidate why they didn't finish their degree and decide, you know, whether this is really important or not. But you can see how the process works. So in the end, I'm going to have this information about their similarities and differences, and I'm going to be able to make an evaluation about whether this candidate is alike or is like my current employee in ways that matter and that the ways in which they are different do not matter. Okay. All right. So now let's look at a legal issue. As a, as a sort of second example of analogical reasoning. Um, <clears throat> the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution requires that the police have to have a warrant that is supported by probable cause if they want to engage in a search or a seizure. Just trust me on this. Um, but one of the issues that comes up again and again and again and again in criminal procedure is what exactly is a search? At what point does police behavior become a search? Um, the base standard, right, the, 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 what we call the seminal case is a case called Katz versus United States from 1967 that says that the government engages in a search when it violates a subjective expectation of privacy that society recognizes as reasonable. So you have to have a subjective expectation of privacy and that expectation has to be reasonable in light of society's expectations. Okay, 
looking now at how we apply that rule to a case, one of the issues that has come up in the past is whether the police are engaged in a search when they put a tail on a car. In other words, when a police car follows a suspect turn by turn as they move through the streets. This is generally not considered a search because when you get in your car and you drive around town, you don't have an expectation of privacy. Anybody, anybody can see your car passing by. Anybody could say, I'm going to follow that red Honda and see where it goes. Um, and either on purpose or accidentally, coincidentally, they may end up knowing that you're going to the Kroger, right? Um, so you don't necessarily, you don't really have an expectation of privacy when the police are following your car. What about when the police are monitoring your car's position with a GPS tracker that they have stuck to the undercarriage of your vehicle um, with a magnet? Is that a search or not? So we have a disputed incidence, which is, or a disputed instance, which is the GPS tracker. And we have a base point, which is the turn by turn tail of a car. What are their similarities and what are their differences? You could make the argument that they are the same because in both cases, the police are acquiring the same information. They're acquiring information about where your car is at any given moment, right? And they're either doing that electronically or through visual observation. What, what difference does it make whether it's electronic or visual observation? They're getting the same information. In both cases, you continue to be free to go to the Kroger and to go to Walmart and to go to Target. And obviously I need to do my grocery shopping today. So I'm thinking about those places, uh, but you are free to move, drive around your town. They are not um, imposing on you. They are not making you feel uncomfortable. Um, no harm, no foul, right? So those are the similarities. But there are differences. One is that it is much less expensive for the police to track you using GPS than it is to track you with um, a tail by following you. With a GPS device, they could stick it on your car and then two weeks later they can download the information and they have it, right? Took 20 minutes to put the GPS on your car and 20 minutes to download the information. If they actually followed you, it would require paying a human being to spend 24 hours a day watching your vehicle, right? And it would cost the gas money to drive around and the wear and tear on the vehicle. And it would just be a lot more expensive. Does that affect your expectation of privacy? Is that difference relevant to the rule about having an expectation of privacy? I don't know. <laughs> um, I can see both sides here. One possibility is that no. What difference does it make how much it cost the police my expectation of privacy is the same. I don't have an expectation of privacy that when I get in my car and drive around, no one will know where I'm going. I don't have that expectation of privacy. What difference does it make how the police get the information or how much it costs them to get the information? That's one position. The other side would be, absolutely makes a difference because tailing me is um, expensive. And so I don't expect 
that anyone is doing that. <laughs> I have I have an expectation of privacy because I cannot fathom that the police would spend that much time and money to follow me around 24 seven for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Um, so, you know, somebody having that much information on me does seem weird, right? It, it does violate my expectations. So I could see how this would go either way. Another difference is that when the police follow you in a car, um, they may be writing down where you are, but the format of that information is going to be kind of clunky. Whereas GPS data is incredibly detailed. Um, they can see not only where you stop, but where you drive, which roads you are on. Um, a, the police tailing you can see that as well, but they're unlikely to record that information in a way that is useful. So perhaps what is interesting about my behavior is not where I go, but the fact that every time I go out, I make a point of driving by that person's house, right? Every time, no matter where I'm going, I always drive past that house. That is information that a tail is unlikely to notice. But GPS data is very likely to show that because they will see why does that line on the map keep turning red right there, right? It becomes very visual and you can see those patterns. There are patterns that will emerge from the data that a GPS device provides that the data collected by somebody tailing you would not provide. So the method in which the information is gathered changes the way it can be interpreted. And as a result may change whether or not you have an expectation of privacy. I don't know. Um, so what do you think? Is GPS monitoring of a car a search? Keeping in mind that following your car is not. Okay. All right. Have fun with that. And I will uh, talk to you all again soon.